This is a reading from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 7. Here is my servant, whom I I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nation. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord, God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to his people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. So, Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus, that he's alive in us, um, and that he gives us a life to live for him. Uh, Father, we um, invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning as we reflect on your words, who you are, the life of Jesus, and the life of Jesus in us. Um, And so, Holy Spirit, come and do what you want today, we pray. Amen. Mm. Right. So today, as um, David said, I want to start a new series which I believe is incredibly pertinent to where we are as a church today and the times that we're in. And I think the subject that we're going to be looking at is something that's probably always been important to us as a church, but sometimes I think it's probably something that we haven't really always valued as much as we think. And so what's that subject? Well, that subject is hope. That's right, because David told you, didn't he? Yep, so much for that. But as you probably know, that when it comes to hope, it's one of three big values that are in the New Testament that we discovered. Do you know what the big three are? Faith, hope, and love. That's right. And where do we find that? In the Bible. (laughs) Yeah, okay, yeah. Where in the Bible do we find that? In the back. Oh, my goodness. Okay, here we go. 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah, goodness me. Oh, man, I thought you'd be up more up to the play on that one. That's right. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 13, tells us this. Though these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So um, this is talking about the greatest values of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and we often, when we talk, we, um, as, as is rightly so, we place a lot of considerable emphasis on love, as it's the greatest. And we regularly talk about the importance of faith, believing in Jesus. But sometimes... When it comes to hope, it's a little bit like the youngest sibling in the family. It doesn't always get the love or the attention of its older brothers. Uh, so over the next few weeks, I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on the significance of hope uh, for the church. Because I, I feel that as a, as a church, if we can grasp hold of the value that hope offers to us and to the people around us, it will have a dramatic impact on the way we witness and the way we are able to witness to Jesus Christ. And also, as well as that, it'll help make clear the reasons why we do the things we do as a church. So, what about hope? Well, in 1 Peter um, chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Peter tells the church, he says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Have you heard that one before? Yeah. Now, a passage that many of us, I think most of us look at this passage, and immediately the phrase that springs to our attention is, always be prepared to give a reason. Especially if you're a bit of an evangelist. Because, hey, wouldn't it be nice to always have an answer to everyone's problems with the faith? Wouldn't that be great? You know, like, why does God allow evil in the world? Boom. Or why do good things happen to bad people? 
But actually, if we go back to that verse again, let's actually look at the question the Apostle Peter is asking us to be prepared to, to, be prepared to answer. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for a reason for what? For the, for the hope that you have. Which suggests that hope is actually the critical component in this passage. And the implication here is that we should be people who are regularly radiating hope to all, all the others around us. So much so that it should mess with people's heads. That's what Peter's saying. You know, um, that people should notice us as a hope-filled people. Um, it should be the one thing that's noticeable about us. Or, or to put it another way, we shouldn't expect people to ask us about the hope that we have if we are miserable, self-loathing, judgmental jerks. You know, that, that kind of behaviour doesn't attract people to want what we have. That repels people and certainly doesn't attract people to following Jesus. But you know what? Sadly, I believe sometimes that's what the church behaviour looks like. You know, even in our denomination, you know, the reason the Presbyterian Church got a... This is the reason the Presbyterian Church got a bit of a reputation as the frozen chosen. You know, we believed that we were chosen, but we just weren't that warm to be around. And, and while it's not like it used to be back in the day, that reputation can actually be quite hard to shake sometimes. But Peter was saying to the church that when we live, we are to live in a way that expresses the hope that Jesus offers. And when people see that, they'll be drawn to this hope. Um, and they'll start asking us questions like, well, why are you the way you are? Or why did, why did you choose to do this? You know, what is it that makes you the way you are? Um, what is it that makes you do what you do? And bang, all of a sudden, the Apostle Peter was saying, at this point, the door is open for you to share why you do this, what, how Jesus has influenced you. And, and so I think the big question for us that I'd like to ask for us to consider over the next few weeks is how do we live lives that offer hope to the people around us? Because I suspect if we get this right, then I think introducing Jesus to people will become a lot easier. A lot easier than we think anyway. And so today, I just want to spend a little bit of time exploring what hope is and how we see it reflected in, in Jesus. So, so what is hope? I think for many people, pe people kind of um, think of hope as wishful thinking. I, I remember as a kid when I was running to the train station, I ran in the hope that the train I was trying to catch was running later than I was. And sadly, my hope was often just wishful thinking. Um, and, and we can also kind of associate hope with things like sports teams. You know, for those of you who support the Blues, <laughs> wishful thinking. Or, or the Warriors. <laughs> um, or, or the Warriors, you know, maybe this will be the year. Um, but in that sense of hope, um, which is common to most of us, hope is best understood as wishing for the best. Which means that depending on what it is that you've got your hope on, you will either be rewarded or you'll be disappointed. But this kind of hope and this kind of understanding of hope is actually a little bit different from the biblical understanding of hope because the biblical understanding of hope is based on faith in God. And if you haven't picked it up yet, the Bible says that God is a little bit more reliable than trains or the blues or the warriors. The, the Bible tells us that God is the one who created everything seen and unseen. And so with God, the question we're often not faced with, with God, the question we're faced with um, is not, is he able? Because the Bible says that all things are possible through him. Instead, the question we often find ourselves grappling with is, how good is he? How good is God? And how confident can we be in his goodness towards us? Now in Isaiah 49, uh, verse 23, God says about himself, he says, I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. It's a big statement to make, isn't it? Uh, because here, God is not speaking about wishful thinking, is he? He's, he's speaking about hope in terms of expectation. And he's saying that those who hope in him can expect not to be disappointed. And I think for many of us, this is a way of thinking that we have to get ourselves accustomed to. Because I think for many of us, we are, we are accustomed to thinking about hope in terms of wishful thinking. But if we were to think about hope in terms of expectation, 
this could get a bit risky. Let's be honest. You see, if we expect that God is willing to answer our prayers, that might require us to persist in prayer when we, you know, we might kind of be tempted to give up. And if we expect that God is good, it might require us to wrestle with doubt when God doesn't do what we think he ought to have done. And if we expect that God is actually able to do all things, then that might require us to take calculated risks from time to time. It might require us to put our reputation on the line and trust with him. So hope as an expectation can be risky. But here's the thing. Expectation is also critical to how we radiate the hope of Jesus to the world. Because the extent to which we expect God's goodness... Did I get that sentence right? Yeah. To the extent that we expect God's goodness, that will impact how we respond to the situations life throws at us. Expectation um, that God is good can be the difference between um, continuing on and giving up. And and our expectations can dramatically um, um, affect the way we respond to those around us. Because if we believe that God is outrageously good to us, then is that going to affect the way we treat other people? Yeah, probably will do. If we think that God's always disappointed in us, it's probably going to rub off on the way we treat other people too. So what do we expect of God? What is it that we're hoping in Him for? Because we'll either hope in Him, or we'll find ourselves hoping in something else. And we see this kind of getting played out in the Bible in Matthew chapter two and in the story, no, chapter twelve in the story of Jesus, verses one to twenty-one. Because we have a couple of stories here of Jesus coming into conflict with some of the religious leaders of Israel, the Pharisees. And what's really interesting in this is both of these conflicts are based around expectations of who God is. And there's the hope that the Pharisees hold, and there's the hope that Jesus holds. And these two hopes are based on two very different things. The hope of the Pharisees is based on them getting everything right. But the hope of Jesus is based on the expectation that God is good. And as a result of this, we see their behaviours are radically different. And the way they treat the people around them are radically different. Now the first of these stories begins as Jesus um, with a crowd of people are wandering through a field of grain on the way to um, the synagogue for Sabbath. I guess it's like kind of being on your way to church on a Sunday morning. And as they're walking by, um, Jesus' disciples pick a few grains of wheat from the field and begin to eat them. At which point, the others in the cr- those in the crowd who are Pharisees start to complain to Jesus. That, hey, your boys, your boys are breaking the rules. Because technically, by taking grain from a field, it's technically it's working. I mean, now you might think, well, why was that such a big deal to them? Because it, was a, because it was the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was a holy day. And, and according to the Ten Commandments, what were you not supposed to do on the Sabbath? Work. And so you might think, well, that's being a little bit picky, isn't it? But to the Pharisees, their hope was tied into their obedience to the law. You see, they believed that God was good to them, but only to the extent that they followed the rules. And Jesus responded to them by calling them out on their pickiness, by saying, do you really understand God at all? You know, if you did, you'd know what I mean when I say, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and you wouldn't have condemned the innocent. See, Jesus was pointing out to the Pharisees that their hope was actually based on the things they were doing for God rather than a response to his goodness. Their expectation expectation was, hey, if we do enough right things, then God will be pleased with us. But Jesus was inferring that obedience to the law will not make make God love you any more or any less. And that kind of upset them. But then we move on to this next story. uh, And this difference between the, the hope of Jesus and the hope of the Pharisees becomes even more obvious once they enter the synagogue. Because sitting in the synagogue as, as they all enter is a man with a shriveled hand. And the Pharisees who'd been following Jesus pointed this out to him. And they tried to get him in trouble by saying, hey, what about this guy? Hey, you know, we think healing, something, healing someone is work and the law says you can't work on the Sabbath. So what are you going to do about that guy with the shriveled hand? See, they're trying to get Jesus into a bit of trouble here. And Jesus had a legitimate option here. He could have ignored the sick man. 
He could have um, sat through the service and then afterwards gone up to have a coffee in the Wilson Centre or their equivalent. And, and nobody would have been any the wiser. But instead, Jesus took the bait. Because they tried this, probably because they tried this on him earlier in the day and he wanted to challenge their thinking. And, and so he looks at the man and, and turning back, he looks at them and he says, Hey, if any of you guys had a sheep and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't you take hold of that sheep and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to that man, stretch out your arm. And the man stretched out his arm, it says, and he was healed. Now, looking at those two stories from our perspective, they, they kind of seem like really silly things to argue about. You know, picking grain and, and healing someone's arm. But actually, these, back in that day, what happens after, directly after Jesus heals this man's arm? The Pharisees plotted how they might kill Jesus. I mean, this really got them angry. And, and you kind of think, well, why so harsh for miraculously healing someone on God's holy day? But it actually highlights the danger of what can happen when you place your hope in the wrong thing. See, Jesus' hope was in the goodness of God. Jesus believed that God was good. He believed that God was more interested in being merciful than following rules to the letter. And Jesus had an expectation that God was a God who wanted to bring blessing. So Jesus healed the man. And then for the impact of Jesus' hope, brought life and blessing to the people around him. But the Pharisees saw things differently. Although they believed in the same God as Jesus did, the Pharisees' hope wasn't based on an expectation of God's goodness. You could say that their hope wasn't actually based on God at all. Their hope was based on this expectation that, hey, if I do enough good things, like being stringently obedient to the law, then God will be pleased with me. And so it didn't really matter to them how other people were coping with their life because their hope had nothing to do with how good God was. It was to do with how good they were. To them, goodness was measured by keeping the rules. And the ironic thing throughout the whole gospel is that these religious leaders who were so committed to being the best actually ended up being the worst of all time. They killed the very person God sent to save them. And they didn't even realise they were doing it. Why? Because their hope was in the wrong thing. Their hope was in how good they were rather than how good God is. And I, and I can't help but wonder here how if this story about Jesus and the Pharisees can actually apply to us in some ways because I'm pretty sure most of us aren't as anally retentive about following every aspect of the law like the Pharisees were. You know, I think most of us are fairly loose when it comes to things like the Sabbath and that. But I still can't help but wonder that when it comes to the subject of where our hope is found, more often than not we still fall into the trap of having hope in our own goodness rather than the goodness of God. And so when it comes to demonstrating the hope that within us, is the, pra the practical hope that is within us, for, say for example like praying for someone else, or, or taking a step out in faith, or, or, think, or hearing from God, our first thought is, I'm not good enough. You know, that's for someone more spiritual than me. Maybe that's something my wife does. Not picking on any people in particular. But where, but where is the hope in those sentences? Is it in the goodness of God? Or is it in the goodness of ourselves? Does this make sense? See, often I think we think, I'm not good enough, therefore God can't use me. And can I challenge you with a question this morning? It's, how good do you have to be before God can use you? At what level does it kind of reach the level that actually God can use you? Who is your hope in? Is it in you or is it in the goodness of God? And I think we need to seriously challenge ourselves about this. Because hope in ourselves is not the answer. Instead, I would say that the degree of hope and expectation is in God's goodness to us will be the determining factor to the extent which God will be able to use us. Because our own goodness or, or lack of goodness will um, never limit God's ability to work through us. Because we're not saved by our own goodness. It's not by, it's not by hope in ourselves that will change the world. 
Instead, it's the hope that we have in Jesus and in God's goodness to us made available through, it, through him. So this morning, what I'm kind of saying is that the hope that we have is we don't need to be perfect for God to use us. And that's good news, because um, I'm sorry to break it to you guys, but none of you are perfect. <laughs> I've known you long enough now. <laughs> Only in Christ we're made perfect. And so we just need to be willing to expect that God wants to work through each one of us to reach out to this world with love. So with that in mind, what I want to do um, today is pray. And pray that God would open our minds to how good he is. And that our hope would be founded on God's goodness to us. And that we might be able to find ourselves acting out of this expectation. Um, even if that means things might get a little bit scary at times. Um, so does that sound okay? So can I pray? Shall I pray? Mm. Well, Father, when Jesus walked the earth, one of the things he used to teach was repent for the kingdom of God is near. And Lord, that repent word is an interesting word because often uh, we think of it as stop being bad. But actually what repent means is renew your mind. And Lord, I think a lot of us need help renewing our mind, changing our mind, because I think we're so bad, so weighed down sometimes by how bad we are. We struggle to realise how good you are to us. So Father, forgive us for those times we've had hope in our own righteousness rather than your goodness particularly um, as we're right after Easter now, when we remember that it was you who became sin for us, that we could own your righteousness. So Lord, I would ask that you would open our minds to how good you are. That our hope would be based on your goodness to us, rather than our worthiness or unworthiness. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to break us free from a bondage to the law because that law ultimately leads to death. And Lord, we don't want to be the frozen chosen. We want to be the people marked by your life, a life that comes from an expectation of your goodness. So we, Lord, I would pray for each one of us, Lord, uh, that you would fill us with your boldness, that we'd begin to demonstrate the expectation of the hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, that it would infiltrate the way we pray, that it would be realised in the way we demonstrate faith and generosity, that it would, be, um, influence, it would influence the way we express love, that we would believe, we would show by the way we live that you are good. So come, Holy Spirit. We invite you, Lord, to increase our awareness of the love of God for us, that you might be glorified through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.